Hi, I'm Francesca Saratella, author of Ghosts of Harvard. And in this video, I wanna tell you about the 10 year journey to publication that I went with this debut novel and about how I learned to push through those obstacles that every new writer faces, whether they be from the outside world or our own insecurities and how I found the way to listen to my own voice. So first, let me give you a little overview about what this book is about. Ghosts of Harvard is a non-traditional thriller. It's part psychological suspense, part uh, even supernatural his historical elements. And I really think at its heart, it's a family story. It follows Katie Archer, who is a young woman struggling in the aftermath of her beloved older brother's suicide on Harvard's campus. Um, he was her idol. She adored her older brother. He was the golden child of their family. And when he began exhibiting signs of mental illness and ultimately was diagnosed with schizophrenia, it was harder to, for her to understand, but she could never have imagined that he would make the unfathomable choice to take his own life. We begin the book in that aftermath when she herself has decided to attend Harvard. Her much to her family's pain. They don't want to revisit that campus in any way, shape, or form. But Katie knows that she is haunted by so many unanswered questions about her brother and why he made that choice. Why then? What could have happened? What could have been done differently to maybe have saved his life? And she knows those answers are only in one place. So she decides to go to Harvard to try to piece together the mystery of his final year. And while she's there, she fears she's losing her grip on reality herself. As she's trying to explore her brother's last year, she begins to hear voices. And then the new question is, does she share the same mental illness as her brother? Or are these voices something else? She begins to believe they're ghosts. And if she listens to them, will they lead her to the one voice she craves, her brother's? Or will they lead her down a path of her own self-destruction? That's the plot of Ghosts of Harvard. And it all sounds and looks pretty polished now, I mean, despite my shortcomings as a videographer, but it was a long journey. I worked on this book for 10 years before you see it right now. And uh, I I share this story in, the, in that, and that path not to, I, you know, I used to feel so embarrassed that it was 10 years. I, you know, we're so trained to think that if we're good at something, we're going to find quick success. And it just, that isn't the way, because as any of you writers know, and I, I know there's a lot of writers watching and I hate the term aspiring writers because I think if you're working on it and you're writing, you are a writer. You know, we, we have to validate ourselves and give ourselves permission to take ourselves seriously Publish, whether you're published or not. That's the most important thing. But it took me a long way and a long time to get to that kind of mindset and where I could trust myself to listen to the voices inside me. Um, and I want to tell you about that whole road. So honestly, it's, the pushback from the outside world, it can, it can start early, you know. I even remember I went to Harvard myself. That's uh, part of what inspired the novel. And I remember when I got into my very first creative writing class and you have to apply to in creative writing classes there. And I was so nervous and so excited and I got in and I had the highest hopes and I just, it was oil and water with that first professor. She just did not like me. Nothing I could do <laughs> could please her. And I tried so hard. Um, and I remember one time I submitted my story to our workshop and normally she would sit back and just let the students discuss it and it was always anonymous, but the, the professor knew, you know, which one of our stories was being submitted, but none of the classmates did. And I remember when it was my turn, she did the rare move to give a little opening number about my story and how much it sucked. <laughs> and, and she made the proclamation that this writer's voice will never sustain a longer, a longer work. And so here I am with my 480 page debut novel, <laughs> which is just a little fun thing. But let me tell you, I didn't have this chutzpah back then. Back then, I just wanted to crawl into a hole and die or give up. But I remember I even I went to um, her office hours. I tried to work it out. I was like, I feel like we aren't driving or got, you know, got on a, on a bad foot somehow. And what can I do? And she insisted that she was giving me this harsh criticism to make me better. Maybe she was, but I really felt it defeating my spirit. And that was one of those times where I very much wanted to quit. And, but I had this little voice in my head going, you know, I don't know if you're that good. 
but I don't think you're that bad. That's me talking to myself. You know, I knew I, I didn't think I was good, but I knew I wasn't that bad. And that little voice, and I listened to that little voice that was like, you're feeling really crushed, but you want to keep going. And somehow found the courage to, yes, drop that class. Because sometimes when you're in an environment that's really zapping you and just zapping your creativity and zapping your spirit, you got to just get out of it. So I withdrew so late that I had to take a withdrawal and take an extra course later. <laughs> but what the courageous part for me was that I had to write the creative writing department head at Harvard and request if I had dropped, if I had withdrawn, kind of, you know, not the most kosher way of taking the class. If I had withdrawn from a class that late, would a would I be able to take a, another creative writing class, apply to another one, or were I forbidden? And I wanted to ask if I, would it be still eligible to apply for a creative thesis, which was a very rare thing. They only gave out a few a year for your senior thesis if you were able to do that, and this was my junior year. And um, so I felt crazy because I already felt so ashamed that this teacher didn't like me. And then I was going to take it even farther and write this creative writing department head and go, yeah, well, I felt so miserably in the beginning writing class. Can I please apply for this even higher thing? But um, that when I emailed this writing department head, um, he wrote me back and he said, I you could be the worst writer in the whole world, but don't quit just because somebody told you that you weren't the, that you weren't great. Stick with it. And he became what that became one of the most pivotal relationships for me through my entire college years. Um, that was the author and brilliant writer himself, Brett Anthony Johnston, and he took me, um, gave me a chance. He didn't give me any special treatment. He just gave me a chance. He gave me that clean slate that I needed. And it ended up being so formative. His workshop had a completely different vibe, had a completely different spirit. I really blossomed under his teaching and under his mentorship. And he's still a friend to this day. So that was step one. That was the first time that I listened to myself and it paid off. And I now I think if I hadn't Either A, if I had actually quit, that would have been terrible. B, if I had stuck it out with that professor who was just crushing me, you know, that was not what I needed to do. I needed to get into just a more simpatico situation. This arts are so subjective and that really paid off. And it was a, ended up being, you know, foretelling some of what came, what came afterwards. So then I wrote, I, I, did, I did get to write a creative thesis. I, I wrote a short novel as my senior thesis, and I was so fortunate to um, do well with it and win some awards with it. And it it, it did well enough as a, as I was a student to get the attention of an agent after college. And I was like, you know, I really I knew I had to expand it if I wanted to sell it. But this agent thought it would be a great idea to just get a little bit of feedback from an editor about you know, how to expand it in what way. So we gave it to one editor and, and they wrote me back. And you know, when it's like you, you were all ready for feedback, but then you think you hear the one thing that you're like, oh, so the feedback was beautiful writing, but you really need something more high concept. And now it's like, oh, how do you change? You can't change the concept. <laughs> so I was all feeling all defeated and feeling like, oh, high concept. And I thought, you know, now I was a recent college grad, just a normal, girl trying to make a freelance writing career in New York City at the time. And I go, what could I possibly write with any authenticity that is high concept? And my brain provided this, just, you know, when it's like subconscious, this my subconscious provided a little answer and it just said, what about Haunted Harvard? And of course, then, you know, we also have that other part of our brain, our super ego that always, always chastising us, always disparaging our ideas that was like, oh, that's so hokey and stupid and haunted Harvard. What does that even mean? But it was circulating. And when I actually gave it time to breathe a little bit, I think I realized that the reason that haunted Harvard was in my head is because I actually did experience tangentially. I had a really painful memory of something at Harvard when I was a student and it stayed with me. It haunted me. And only through this little germ of an idea did I revisit it. And that is that when I was a junior, a young man in, in my college dorm, my upperclassman dorm, took his own life. And he wasn't a close friend. He wasn't someone I knew well, but he was a person and a face that I was used to seeing and saying hello to in the dining hall and 
especially someone who I never would have guessed was suffering. That's the cruel thing about mental illness, that it's invisible. You can have something that might be a near fatal illness and yet is utterly invisible to the people in the community around him. And we were all shocked and saddened, but you know, I don't think we knew how to comfort each other as a community. It's, it's still a hard thing to talk about suicide. And my classmates and I, we didn't discuss it much more than just the initial story, but it weighed on all of us. And then a year later, when, you know, I sadly, you know, it was all but compartmentalized and locked away in some box of bad, scary thoughts for me and not something we were still talking about or thinking about. I read an article that his little sister had learned to play guitar because he was a musician, had learned to play guitar in that year's time and had actually come to Harvard's campus and played a tribute to him on the anniversary of his death. And I read that, I remember just being knocked back in my futon and thinking, what was that year like for her? That for all of us who were, who shared a sorrow and a trauma, you know, the trauma of having that happen in your community, but compartmentalized it, built walls up, didn't really reach out to one another. That's an option if you're an acquaintance, but for a family, that's not, a, that's not an option. A tragedy like suicide does not happen to one person in a family. That's why the loved ones are called suicide survivors. And I was just really struck by thinking about this perspective from a different story. I um, mean, you know, rather the story from a different perspective from the sister's perspective. And, and thinking of you know a traditional thriller which might begin with a death and everyone's professing their innocence and this is a death for which everyone feels guilty and that became this when i only when i let myself stop shushing that voice inside and let myself hear it that then that was something i got really excited about and i do want to be really clear this book is not in any way literally based on that family there was no other I didn't do any of this, not based on them in any way. Then I just let my imagination run wild, but it came from that memory that I had locked up. And it came from being so inspired by that sister's love. And then I let my imagination run wild with it and run wild with a high concept version of it. You know, I kind of just gave myself permission to take the lid off my thinking and really explore. And it became an idea that I became so excited and passionate about that it lasted me the entire decade it took of working on it. Only problem was, remember that old agent who was so you know excited about the short novel I wrote? This new vision that I had for this new book, it just didn't resonate as much with her. She really had enjoyed the vision of the novel I wrote and as my thesis. And we weren't, comp you know, that's another thing where, again, the arts are a subjective business. And it's easy to just think when you have one industry voice in your, you know, in the conversation that that is the industry. But the book industry and the publishing industry is not a monolith. And you do, even though it feels scary, you have to be open. You're always open to feedback and open to criticism, but also to stick, you have to find like-minded folk, people who share your vision. And then when people share your vision, take all the input. So I made the really freaky, scary choice for me because it felt like flying without a net to decide to look for a new agent with this book. Um, but it was the best thing I ever did because then I found agents who were so excited and shared my enthusiasm and amplified it. And when you're surrounded by that kind of enthusiasm, you can just let your vision grow even better and become into crisper, clearer clarity. And of course, like I said, it meant I went through a bunch of revisions with them too. So it wasn't like, oh, and then I was published and it was done. Nope, I went through many more revisions before we even tried to send it out to editors, but Again, I was doing it with like-minded people so that it worked. And then I found my happiest home at Random House with my dream editor who I just, I pinch myself every day that I get to work with this woman. We are so in sync from our first conversation we had about this book. It was just like, I was talking to a smarter version of myself, <laughs> which was great. And it seemed like then I had reached my happy ending. Book was sold, had gone through one entire revision, was pretty much ready to get it copy edited and then it was around 2016 that harvard came out with um it went public with this history of slavery on harvard's campus and i will tell you this book um without spoiling too much this book does have these three ghost characters who are from different moments in harvard's history and even in the original version 
I had a character who was a young black woman who was from the 1880s during this period of time that Harvard had uh, basically this weird indentured servitude type uh, employment situation. That's the word I'm looking for. Employment where they would uh, hire wayward girls, but never really let them make enough money to actually get out of it. It was this whole like historical comment on, you know, potential and the privilege of potential. What types of people in our country are given the privilege of potential and what, whose potential is stolen away by, in this case, racism. And, uh, oh, I had all this interesting stuff about the reconstruction era and all these things. And then Harvard comes out with this history that there were once slave, pe people were enslaved in the Harvard president's office in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s, before our nation was even founded. And then I thought, oh my God, this is an even clearer, truer version of all the things I was had in that previous character. And I suddenly felt like, when you know that there are enslaved people, to write about underpaid people, even if that is exploitative, is I was whitewashing the truth. And it was really this one of the major themes of this novel is to be skeptical of the stories that we tell ourselves or that we learn about either our personal histories or our national histories, because you don't know what facts are missing and what voices are missing. And here I had this living example that had just confronted me after the book was written and everything was ready to go of that. And I said to myself, that little voice inside me said, you gotta change this book. You have to rewrite this character to include this history because it's the truth. And it's truer of what you would even set out to do. And I remember I knew it was gonna delay things and I, uh, my editor said, you know, you don't have to. I mean, the book works as it was, but in my heart of hearts, I knew that it didn't work as well as it could. And I really felt like the universe had sort of given me this new avenue for even more relevant research and even more important research and how that history had been buried already for so centuries and that it was time for it to come out and that if I had the opportunity to let this book speak to that, that I really wanted it to. And I decided I completely took the old character out. I trashed all that 1800s, 1880s research that I had done and completely recommenced to come up with this new one. But it was, it was uncanny how well that it fit already with the themes that I was interested in. And honestly, it really reinvigorated me at the end of it. Like I said, at this point already, like an eight years long journey, it gave me this incredible shot of new energy. And I know it was the right thing. And I know the book is stronger for it. And I think it ended up being a really good lesson of just staying flexible and staying open. And, you know, because I think that's, you get such mixed messages in the beginning as a writer. You get, on the one hand, it's like, be true to yourself, stick, you know, stick with it. But also then you have to be humble and, and open to criticism and looking for voices and workshops. And it's like so much input. So it's always hard to negotiate what is staying true to what is staying standing firm and what is being open to learning and this was one of those cases where they were one and the same being open and flexible to change and to learning and improving was actually staying closer to my vision and hewing closer to that dream that I saw in my mind's eye and I'm so grateful that my editor gave me the space to do that. I mean, I, I, I demanded it, but <laughs> she was very supportive also. And I'm so glad that this book is really in its final form. It feels, even though it went through countless drafts in the last decade. And I really say that to encourage you, if you are going through the millionth draft of your own thing, if it takes drafts, it doesn't mean because you're failing or struggling. It just takes that. This was... It was barrel aged, but it, it was the, every project has its own pace. It was exactly the way it was supposed to be. Um, my story as an author and as a, from aspiring writer, my least favorite term, from aspiring writer to published author was exactly the way it was supposed to be. And I just had to have faith and listen to that voice inside me. So if any of you are working on your projects, I hope you take yourself seriously, car whether that means carving out just an hour a day to write, you know, 300 words a day, whatever little thing you can do to honor yourself, to honor your work, 
and see it all the way through. You will be so happy and one day I will be watching your video at Thriller Fest. Thanks so much. Bye.